So I'm really excited to present our speaker for today, Megan Ennis. Um, she's the assistant curator for Museum Education. Yes. I get that right. Yes. Excellent. Um, she works with science education, uh, especially in underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, really excited to hear her message for today. And thank you for coming. Great. Hi, everybody. So glad you were able to make it and join us both here and in person. Uh, here in person and online. How about that? Um, Really glad to talk with all of you today and tell you a little bit about who I am and what I'm doing here on campus and how hopefully we can all find some interesting ways to collaborate in the future. Um, so that's what I just said. We're going to talk about who I am, what I'm doing, and how you can get involved in some really, really interesting things happening here. So as it was mentioned, I am the new assistant curator of museum education. This is a really long title that says I'm faculty over in the Department of Natural History, and we all have the title of curator. However, my collection is a little more ambiguous as my collection is education. So I am housed over in the Natural History Museum. So if you ever want to come over and hang out, let me know. And the position is new. so. I'm still working out what exactly it is that I'm looking at and what directions to go. So it's a really wonderful time to start thinking about collaborations. Martha and I are working on some interesting projects. Uh, some of the current research I'm doing is going to look at how families engage with their toddlers in toddler spaces in museums. So we're working with the Harlem Museum to look at how are parents engaging with their children and how can we better facilitate engagement so that they can support their kids learning and interest not only in science but also in museums generally. I'm also doing some work looking at how we can help public school teachers teach evolution using resources developed by the museum and the university at large. So hopefully we will have the opportunity to bring a lot of teachers here to campus to learn how we can help support them in teaching what is often seen as a very complex subject for a wide range of reasons. And I'm also looking at how we can use distance learning in museums. And so that's a way that many universities are moving as we all saw in our email, we may be moving that direction sooner than we thought, but museums are also thinking about how they can leverage the internet to develop programs and I want to help them figure out what those best practices should look like. So lots of really interesting things going on, but for today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work, um, as mentioned, with underrepresented groups and trying to help encourage the next generation of STEM professionals, however that may look. So, let's see here. I know you are all so familiar with the fact that we are struggling to recruit and retain a diverse group of scientists. Um, we have spent the last 40 years trying to change what science should look like. And unfortunately, we really haven't seen a major shift. And so a lot of what we are looking at is how can we help make people feel more comfortable and interested in these kinds of careers? Because we are preparing students for jobs that don't even exist yet. And if we can't even get them thinking about wanting to do science, we're really gonna struggle to bring in the kinds of people we need and the more diverse our scientists are, the more creative we're going to be and the more insight and perspectives that we'll bring together to really make wonderful changes on this planet. So I want you all to think about why you became a scientist. I am sure everyone in this room has some sort of memorable moment that really made you say, holy cow, this is amazing. For me, when I was young, I wanted to be a geologist because I thought that meant having a really cool rock collection. My colleagues at work tell me that is more or less what it means, so <laughs> I apparently missed the boat there. Um, so I really wanted to be a geologist, but then I went to visit a zoo, and a woman walked into the old world monkey house, and the monkey came from the far end of the room and ran and jumped into her arms and said, I'm gonna be a zoologist. <laughs> so now I can go hug monkeys, because who doesn't want to do that? And then I was super fortunate to have parents who were very interested in science who let me take a scuba class in a lake in Indiana. And that's when I decided to be a marine
Planet's Habitus is partly dependent on the capital you have. So do you know people who do these things? But these are just also the behaviors that you choose to engage in. Do you go to the museums on weekends? Or do you choose to do athletics instead? And as we go through these, all of these pictures are families that were in my program and uh, doing really <laughs> awesome things related to science. So our hope was that if we could support the science capital and science habitus of these families and make them see that some science is something they do as a family for fun, perhaps we could shift the perceptions people have about STEM and STEM careers. So to start this whole study, all right, we're just, okay. There we are, great. So to start this whole study, we did a nationwide survey of students all across the country and asked them a bunch of questions about their um, science experiences. And this is no longer impress. So if you do want a copy of this article, it just got um, published. So we're very excited about it. And we validated the survey and we found out that it was valid for four different factors. So four things that influence the science capital and your beliefs about being able to do science. So science expectancy looks at your self-efficacy. I think I can do science, as well as your perceptions of whether other people think you can do science. So that first one was all about perceptions of self related to science. Science experiences, pretty self-explanatory there. Um, do you go on hikes? Do you collect rocks? Things like that. Future science task value was whether they saw themselves using science in the future, regardless of whether or not it was part of their career. And then family science achievement value was whether you think your family values science, knows a lot about science, and different questions related to how does your family perceive science. So we were able to look at these, and what we found was that they were significantly higher for any child who knew anyone who worked in STEM or knew somebody who did STEM as a hobby. So having access to people who do these things really increased how the kids saw themselves as being able to do science, as well as whether they would want to do science in the future. So we were really excited to see this, and we wanted to take a systems approach to supporting this science interest. We have spent the last 40 years, as I said, trying to recruit and retain people in STEM, but most of these programs that we've been spending lots of money on are really cool programs for kids, and then you send them home, and the parents are like, that's nice, <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. So we wanted to put together a program where the, not only the kids had opportunities to have these experiences, but the parents did as well, because then they would have a better understanding of the types of careers, the kinds of education you need to pursue those careers, and how they could help support their children's interest in STEM. So our study used a few different frameworks, the science capital that I already talked about, so resources you have related to science, family science habitus, who we are and what we do related to science, Expectancy value theory has to do with whether you think you'll use something in the future and whether it's worthwhile to you. And social cognitive career theory, which more or less says that almost any career decision you make is not in a vacuum by yourself. You are influenced by the people around you, society, your teachers, all of those sorts of things. So we looked at these all together and tried to create a program using all the best practices we know about what works well for students. So we developed a model that involved a whole lot of stuff, but we worked with three museums, a children's museum, a natural history museum, and a planetarium, and they recruited 20 families through their community partners, so partnerships they already had, with Title I schools and after-school programs that supported families from low wealth, underrepresented communities. And these museums hosted 10 programs over the course of the year, and the families came one weekend, one day a month. And we tried to make it really flexible because we know every day has a lot going on. So if they miss one at their museum, they could either go to a different program within the museum or go to one of the other three, three museums 
and each museum hosted a larger event for all of the families at one point during the year. So they all came together. But the things that were really, really important about our program is that we started every program with food. Because what brings people together better than food? And it helps to alleviate some of the stresses that might come with having to have your children somewhere at 10 o'clock on a Saturday, and then you have to go to a sporting event right afterwards. So we did it to build community, but also to help support the families. They then got to meet a STEM professional, a whole range of people from, um, we had somebody from the Army Corps of Engineer. We had people who raised plants and birders and a whole range of people. And we tried to recruit scientists that were more reflective of our families. That was not always easy, but that's part of recruiting projects. I know it's a problem. The families had opportunities to engage in activities together. And that was a struggle for some of our parents because they were non-competitive collaborative projects that sometimes the parents didn't know how to work with their children, so they stood back and watched. And so that's part of where the project Martha and I are hoping to start came into play, was how do we support the parents into doing this kind of work? And then at the end of the day, they got take-home activities to continue learning about the day's topic. And those ranged wildly from our Natural History Museum, we got a pine cone, a long leaf pine. And in my mind, I'm like, seriously, <laughs> we're giving out a pine cone? Like, the other museum gave out a circuits kit that nobody used because it was too complicated and nobody was told how to use it. But that pine cone, they were sent home and told to wash them because as the humidity changes, they open and close. And so the kids were asked to use them as a weather station. And let me tell you, those kids talked about that pine cone all year long. <laughs> all year long. And... And one parent told me she finally threw it away because the kids enjoyed it so much, he kept putting it in the car and taking it with him to school, and then it'd be rattling around the car. And just how amazing to do that kind of work. But they also had things like, they had a couple different circuits kits. One was much more um, appealing to families, if you're familiar with squishy circuits that you make healthy Play-Doh to make circuits, whereas they sent one home called Einstein Circuits. And that one needed a little more parent facilitation assistance. Um, but at the end of the year, if they came to at least six out of the 10 programs, they got an iPad to keep that they had been using the entire year to take pictures with the scientists, to use apps like Leaf Snap so they could identify plants. And they also received a week of summer camp at their museum. That got a little tricky because we had only budgeted because I forgot to tell you, we were only targeting third, fourth, and fifth grade students, but this was a family program. And the parents came to us and said, I can't send one child to camp, and I cannot afford to send all of my children to a camp. So we shuffled our grant and were able to support every single child of camp age to go to camp because this was supposed to be a family program, but we were so focused on our target children because that's where we lose most kids is that transition from fifth to sixth grade. But thankfully, people came to us early enough that we could say, okay, we can fix this, it's not too late, and everybody can have that opportunity. And so the program was wonderful and just really exciting to think about how do we explore these kinds of things. And I just wanna share two examples with you. The one on the far end, we took our families out bird banding. And this was one of the challenges we ran into. We didn't think about the fact that not all of these families spend time in the outdoors. So the first time they met us at our outdoor location, it was a surprising 32 degrees in October, which we had not expected, and the families did not have the right outerwear. And so from then on, our museum partner brought their basket of hats and gloves and scarves and vests and all of their excess that people have closets full of when you spend a lot of time outdoors so the families could share them. So that was a, one of those learning experiences for us because our, our teens spend so much time outdoors, it didn't even occur to us that we might need to be more clear about proper outerwear. But this day, we took them bird banding. Somebody came early and set up a bunch of mist nets. Every child got to carry a bird to go be in its little bag to be processed. Some kids probably should not have had one, but all the birds were fine. Um, somebody was a little too young, but he 
he he was a younger sibling of one of the families, and he thought he was he knew he was going to be perfect, even though he was only four, and he would always make sure to get his own set of take homes for himself. So it was he was wonderful and sweet, and so each child got to release a bird, and this young man here had seen me pop one take home, and he said, "That's my bird. I get to release that bird." And so he waited three hours because it was the day after they caught us. And we see him here getting ready to let it go. And he lets it go. And they just had this moment. And then the bird was like, oh, okay, great. And took off. But it just to see them connect and have these opportunities to engage is really wonderful. One of the other programs they talked about all year long was finding your spirit ants. We had a researcher who does work with ants and she had characterized the ants based on their behaviors and so they each took a little quiz to find out who their spirit ant was and then they got a button and they went and went looking for ants and one of the kids at the end of the year told us that how important that was because everybody's afraid of ants and they think they're scared of them but they learned how really important they are and how he might want to be an ant scientist someday because he wants to help people understand that ants are really important so we've had some really wonderful scientists come share their love and passion for these events. And over the course of this year, I did 11 intensive family case studies. Um, it was originally three at, uh, four at each of the museums, but we lost one family to their family's death. And all of the parents and children took a pre and post assessment, so that national survey that we looked at in the beginning. We also had a control group of um, students who were fairly similar to our group that came to our programs that also took the pre and post surveys. So our groups were fairly well matched. And when we looked at the control group surveys, they didn't change for any of the factors, which is more or less what we expect if they did not participate in the program. However, we will find out that one of these comes back into play again. Um, for our treatment group, we saw an increase in their science expectancy value. So I see myself as someone who does science. Other people see me as someone who does science. And also the amount of time they were choosing to engage in science activities outside of school. Really exciting. We didn't see a big increase in their future science task value because it was already really high. They already saw themselves as doing science in the future. And their family science achievement values were already high most likely because their family brought them to the family science program. However, when comparing the two groups, we see a, a significant difference between the control and the treatment group for that science expectancy. So again, I see myself as someone who does science. But the other place you saw a big change was the future science task value. The reason for that was the control group saw a drop over the course of the year and whether or not they would see themselves doing science in the future. It wasn't enough to be significant within the group, but it changed them enough that our treatment group, the students who participated in our program, maintained their sense that they want to do science in the future over the course of the year. And that was a big part of the goal of this program, was to be able to maintain that innate curiosity. The reason we didn't see science experiences change is because the control group was higher in the beginning and the treatment group made such a big difference, it was equidistant. And so it doesn't look like they changed significantly because of statistics. Um, anyway, so we were very excited to see that we were maintaining their interest and also really supporting their identity related to science. We were really excited uh, we had a grandparent who brought her grandkids, and we just loved the stories that they told us, that they are becoming more interested in the world, and they want to go to the museum and the parks and the zoos. They ask for more tools related to science. They want bug catching kits and binoculars. So we were really excited to see a wide range here, but it wasn't just the kids who were our target children. We had a mom tell us that her four-year-old daughter who came, when she started the program, she wanted to be a pet sitter when she grew up. And by the end of the program, she wanted to build bridges because we had seen this amazing movie. It's IMAX called Dream Big. It's all about engineering. And this woman goes to the rainforest and builds bridges to let kids go to school for the first time. 
I have to tell you, the first time I watched it, I was like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> Nothing this important. So, you know, we saw that from the youngest children, and we had a parent who told us her seventh grade son who came along, had a learning disability, had never gotten above a D in science, and that year was awarded the Principal's Achievement Award for getting an A for the very first time. And she told us it was due to his participation in our program and seeing the relevance and the interest and the engagement in science. And just, I get goosebumps every time I think about him because we, we got so focused on the kids, we forgot all the other siblings and the parents. We were so focused on the kids, we completely forgot we were also trying to change the parents. And it was awesome what we ha saw here. So when looking at the parents' interviews, I started realizing we needed a different way to really assess what they were telling us. So we started looking at it through the lens of community cultural wealth, which looks at a wide range of capital that predominantly communities of color have. That, you know, these families have a lot of really wonderful things and how can we leverage their experiences to support their children's interests in STEM? So science capital, we already talked about. The parents talked a lot about how they now knew more people who do science. They had more resources to help their kids do science. They themselves had more knowledge about science. Social capital has to do with the people you know. So again, they told us they knew more people engaged in science. They also told us they had built a community of other parents. We would see the kids leave the different parents than they came with to go home with new friends that they had met in the program and that they were engaging and building a community of people who all really liked science and engaged in science. Aspirational capital, this one just knocked my socks off. So this one is looking at your aspirations for the future in spite of or any real or perceived barriers that might be in the way. And it might be aspirations you have for yourself, but it could also be aspirations you have for your child. And so we saw a lot of parents tell us, I am sure my child is going to be a scientist. I know he's going to be, I want her to be. And we saw a big change there, but we had three parents decide that they wanted to go back to school to get a STEM degree. We were just so focused on the kids, we forgot about how these critical junctures can happen at any point in our life. And we keep pushing for making STEM more inclusive and broad, but we forget there's a whole group of people that it is not too late for them to come join us in the STEM field. And we just have to find ways to offer these critical junctures so they can have the same kind of experiences. Linguistic capital is how you talk. As we all know, science has its own language. And if you can't talk the talk, it is very easy to become barred from participating. And so our parents said they were talking more about science as a family. They were having more scientific conversations. One parent told us she would hear her daughter telling her friends things in very scientific language and that it was really changing how they were talking with one another, what they were talking about, the type of words they were using. Familial capital is shared experiences and um, shared knowledge and it's not just your nuclear family. It can include non-family members or extended family members that you consider part of the family. And for a lot of these families, they said they were so glad to be able to actually spend time together and to learn more about what their kid knew. Several parents told me, I had no clue my kid knew so much about science. And so they were learning what kind of knowledge their kids had. They were able to share their experiences. I had a child in the program whose mom was a lab tech, a lab scientist. And he told me time and time again, he did not know anyone who worked in the lab. But by the end, he realized his mom was a scientist. And so we were able to help build some of those familial um, networks within the families. And then navigational capital is knowing how to navigate your way through college applications or how to find programs relating to science that your kids can participate in. And so almost all of the parents said they had a better idea of what was out there and how to find it, and that they also had a network who was sharing information on how to find and navigate those things. So we were really excited to see the parents self-report that they had increased in all of these. And they also told us their family science habits were coaching. So not only were they talking more about science together as a family, they were really assessing how they looked at their family. I had a mom tell me, 
you know, I thought I had an art kid and a sport, a science kid. And I realized that my art kid also really likes science. And why am I pushing this child into art when they can do both? Or one parent, she thought her son was a sports kid. And by the end of the program, realized we can do both. And we can split STEM programs and sports programs. And they were choosing to go to more museums and finding other programs that they could do. And so we were just really excited to see how it changed for families across the board. And so we had a lot of really amazing parents in this program. I mean, one of them drove an hour each day to make sure her kids got to the program every single month. And the gentleman in the back, we were never really sure how he felt about the program. But at the very end, he got to talking about the day he got to the recent word and how that was just such a meaningful and life-changing moment for him. And that he had had just the best time in the program and how wonderful and amazing it was. And we were so excited to hear that not everybody expresses it in the same way, but they all had wonderful per experiences. Uh, this is a an astronaut here who grew up in rural somewhere in the U.S. And he had to go watch the first landing on the moon at a neighbor's house because they didn't have a TV. And his teacher the next day said, any of you can be an astronaut. And he took that to heart, and here he is. And so he shared his story about growing up rural and poor and not having access to any of these things. And now he's been on the International Space Station, I think it's three times. They call it in worlds. Um, I guess I would never work for them either. Um, he was delightful and actually gave up his lunch to spend an extra hour with these families. And we found out that one of the moms here grew up in D.C. and she had always gone to a museum. And the one thing she had always wanted as a child was astronaut ice cream but they couldn't afford it, so she had never gotten it. And that happened to be the snack we gave out that day. And she was just in tears standing meeting a real astronaut and had him sign her astronaut ice cream because she was just so excited about it. And it was just amazing and wonderful, all of these programs. Um, and that's what's really cool about museums and even schools for forest resources and conservation that, that we have really cool opportunities to engage families in these kinds of approaches. And so we are looking to continue this work in um, nine new museums across the country. We have picked museums that serve communities of particular demographics. So one year will be uh, African American, the next year will be Latino, and the third year will be Native American. And so we've partnered with museums that already serve those communities because families food is part cultural. So we want to see if our model works at museums across the country in a wide range of settings. So we're looking forward to doing that. And I'm looking to how can we take it out of the museum? So not everybody has access to come to these places, but can we go to these families where they are located and bring the same kinds of resources that we have and engage them with science in their own backyards, literally or figuratively, you know, their communal backyards, to help them think that you don't have to go away to do science. It's everywhere you are and there are really awesome opportunities to do community-based science and a lot of really neat jobs that here at the university we do all across the state and while they may not come to our museum here you can come to them it's super easy because we're already doing the work there and so one of the opportunities we have on campus here is the Thompson Earth System Institute which is housed at the Natural History Museum has this amazing new program called scientists in every Florida school and they are looking for people who work with earth, land, water, air, anybody who does research in those realms to come partner with us. We will help you translate your work into the classroom, whether you go as a role model to visit and just talk about who you are and what you do and how you got here, or whether you want to go and actually take hands-on activities to really get them engaged, or do a virtual visit via the internet if we can't get to where that school is or you're not able to get there and so it's really wonderful we offer professional development for the teachers but we also offer professional development particularly for graduate students to help you improve your science communication and broader impact skills and we have this wonderful community of teachers that are happy to work with you if you don't feel confident in your ability to translate your work so we have great people at the museum who are doing this work and are really excited about having you engage with them in this program 
I have some flyers up here and the business card for Brian, who helps to run this program. So when we're done, please come get one. We'd love to talk with you more. Because we have really amazing opportunities to create these critical junctures, not just for kids, but for adults. So we never know when we have the opportunity to talk to somebody when it's just going to shift them down a new path because they found out that you do something really amazing and that, well, hey, I can do that too. I didn't even know that was a career. And we can really get them thinking creatively about what it means to be in STEM, who does STEM, and what does STEM look like because it's changing every single day. So really, it's amazing that we are able to do this, whether it's in person or via technology, that we all have opportunities to really share our love and passion to bring in the next generation of STEM professionals. So, I'm Megan. This is my Robin. I also got to release one. I was so excited about it. I was like, can I do one too? <laughs> Mine was not so friendly. He was ready to go, but um, not like the Blue Jay, but so really excited. We had support from NSF for this project, so we have to thank them and all of our undergrads and grad students and volunteers and particularly our families that really went out of their way to make sure their kids had these experiences. But thank you all so much for coming today.